Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Take your Bible tonight, if you will. Over to the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 23. 1 Samuel, chapter 23. 1 Samuel 23. We're going to look at the first four verses here tonight. And uh, I'll try to preach to you in about an hour and a half. All right? Hey, 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 on, but I'll try to condense it down so it doesn't take that long to get it out. For Levitico's son-in-law said he needed two sermons, all right? I don't know if that's true, but that's what he said. Uh, he might be right. I'll uh, tell you for sure that's bad when you get picked on, all right? To somebody that just got allowed into the family anyway, and then they want to pick on you, right? That's bad, that's for sure. All right, if you will, verse 1, uh, 1 Samuel 23, verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for the word of God. We thank you for uh, this book that speaks to our hearts that you've given to us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight to wit take this passage of scripture, we'd learn something, and Lord, not to just file it away, but to put it to use, to make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with what's going on here in 1 Samuel chapter 23, uh, David, uh, in this period of his life, is literally running for his life from Saul. I, I mean, uh, he's, uh, he's been threatened, he knows Saul is after him, and uh, David has kind of had some ups and downs. He's, uh, you know, kind of fallen, relapsed in his faith a little bit. Uh, but uh, God's still taking care of him. And, but he's still running for his life. He's got 400 men around him. And they're really sort of the outcast of everybody else. And uh, the discontented and the disgruntled. And they come and they're back with him. And here he is in this position of running for his life. And it seems kind of odd in some ways when we read these verses, that David would even consider going to the aid of the city of Keilah. Right. I mean, after all, he's got enough trouble to contend with, right? He's got his own problems. Uh, he's got an angry, vengeful king that's in pursuit of him with the one thought, one thought only, and that is, we're going to kill you. Right. Uh, he's got his hands full, all right? He's got his hands full, and there's spies in the land more than happy to tell where David is. Right. So, He's in that situation, but it was at that point that we find the question that David asks in verse 2, and he says, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And I just want to ask you, what in the world would make him say that? What in the world would cause him to even consider it? Well, I believe it's because of what I'm going to preach to you tonight. I'm going to preach to you because I believe the one and only thing that caused him to do it was the demand of duty upon him, the demand of duty upon him. Uh, we need to realize something. If we're saved, we're Christians, there's a call of duty. There is a call of duty. Now, I realize some of you think of that as some stupid video game, all right? But there is a call of duty on our life as a child of God. Notice what the Lord said in verse 2. The Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. Hey, there's, there's the call from God. There's the call from God. Uh, we live in a day, I think, where Christians seem to have forgotten that we have a duty. We, we, we've got a duty. You know, we respect the fact that those people that are in the military have a duty to perform. They have a duty. I'm asking you to pray for Brother Bain. Brother Bain did not go to his superior officers and say, could you please send me back to Iraq? He didn't do that. 
But they told him, you're going, that's his duty. He understands that. He's going to do that, all right? Uh, he understands his duty. We look at those in the military, we think, well, what a good thing it is to have people that'll serve, that'll do their duty. But wait a minute. Yes, sir. You and I as Christians, Come on, amen. we've also got a duty. Yes, sir. We've got just as much duty, all right? And that duty involves the call of God. Amen. The call of God on David was for David to step up. David to step up. David had a duty to serve his God. And David knew it. David knew it. That's why I believe David inquired of the Lord, shall I go? He heard about what was happening, and he inquired of the Lord, shall I go and smite these Philistines? Is this what I need to do? And God's answer came back with the call of God to him. Uh, he had a duty to his God. Wait a minute. So do we. Now, we don't have to go smite the Philistines, all right? We don't have to go smite the Philistines, but we've got a duty. We've got a duty that we need to be involved in. And, and we need to forget, uh, or we need to never forget, pardon me, that there is no option for the child of God when it comes to serving our Lord. There's no option. I'm reading a biography right now of Abraham Lincoln, and then it's during the time, I've got to the point in his life where it's during the time of the Civil War. And uh, they instituted a draft, and it wasn't popular. Not a people protested. But it was different in those days. In those days, you could go and hire somebody to take your place. You could go to that individual. If you were to be drafted, instead of you going to serve, you could go find somebody who was willing to serve if you would pay them so you could hire somebody to take your place. I want to say this to you as a Christian. You can't hire anybody to take your place. Amen. You can't hire somebody else to do your duty. I can't find somebody else and say, listen, I, I need you to do what God wants me to do. So I'm going to pay you. You do what God wants me to do. You can't do that. You can't do it. There's no option. There's no opt-out clause, all right? There's not some fancy, goofy, uh, professional sports contract that's got an opt-out clause. There's no opt-out. We have a duty. We have a call from our God. There's no option about it. We, we're to do our duty. We're to, we're to understand that God's called us, and, and we're to be involved. You say, wait a minute, preacher. He didn't call me. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He called you to salvation. You trusted him as your Savior. Then you became a soldier in the army of the Lord. And you, you became a soldier. There, there's no clause. You know, that. Now, wait a minute. He said, he didn't call me to preach. I didn't call you to preach either. Amen. I said, you're called to serve God. Amen. You're called to be a servant of God. Amen. That is your duty, all right? David realized that. He had a duty to God. And I think David also realized he had a duty to the people of God. You know what? I think we've got a duty to the people of God. I, I believe it with all my heart, all right? Now, remember, David had already been anointed king. David had already been anointed king. Now, he didn't have the position, but I still think he bore some of the responsibility. He knew God has picked me, and I've been anointed to be the next king. Now, I want to remind you, if you will, Romans chapter 11 and verse 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. We don't back out of this thing. And years ago, God called me to preach. There's no termination in that contract. There's no termination. There's no point where I can get to and I can say, okay, I've fulfilled my job. I'm done. I'm done. There, I was going to tell you, there's no retirement clause. And he said, preacher, we don't have a chance in the world of getting rid of you. All right? I didn't say that, all right? Now, there may come that time when I can no longer physically really do everything in the demands, but that doesn't mean God says, okay, you're through. No. Now, my focus may shift, but I'm not out of the army, all right? Not out of the army. Still involved, still have a job to do. I have a responsibility, have a call of God. Part of that call of God is for the people of God. Amen. You said, what am I supposed to do? No, one thing, you're to pray for one another. Bible tells us to pray one for another. Did I say this to you? That's our duty. That is our duty. 
We do not have to wait until there is a calamity or a crisis to call on God in behalf of someone else. We don't have to do that. Brother Shaw back there is young. As far as we know, he's healthy. But we're still to pray for him. We're to pray for him. We're to pray one for another. We're to pray for Sidney. Sidney's going to graduate from high school. Maybe. Well, I'm pretty sure he will. All right. Pretty sure he's going to. He's going to graduate from high school in, in, in just a couple of months, you know. And uh, so he, he's going to be out there. We need to pray for him. We need to pray for him. We need to pray God give him wisdom. He'll make the right decisions what to do, where God wants him to go, and what God wants him to do. We need to pray for him. We need to hold him up in prayer. We need to do that, all right? Mom's 90 years old. She's beyond prayer. No, she's not. No, she's not. We're still to pray for her, all right? It is our duty. Pray one for another. Amen. Pray one for another. All the time, we're to pray for one another, all right? Pray that God will give us strength and God will give us the courage we need and we'll do what we should do and God will take care of us, provide our needs. Pray for each other. That's part of our duty to other people. We've got the call of God. We have that responsibility, all right? And a duty to the people of God. We've got a duty to our God. We've got a duty to the people of God. We're to, we're to be involved in it, all right? There is that call of duty. But won't you see this? Would you look at verse 2? In verse 2, David inquired of the Lord. Hey, is this what I'm supposed to do? Look in verse 4. David inquired of the Lord yet again. What's wrong with you, David? What are you questioning God for? Let me just wait a second. Let me just hang on, all right? David had inquired of the Lord originally. There in verse 2, God said, go. And so he tells his men, we're going. And his men said, would you wait just a minute? Now, David, consider what you're talking about doing. Consider what you're talking about doing. You're talking about us going into that wall city. Look, we're in danger here of being taken captive and, and being killed by Saul and his men. And you want to put yourself in that. You need to be careful. You need to reconsider. Then the Bible said David inquired of the Lord again. I want you to know this. He questioned that call. Now stay with me. Many people never inquire. Many Christians. Amen. Never inquire much of God. Right. And I believe it's because they're afraid that God might want them to do something. Yes, sir. Might want them to do something. You know, I preach to you. I think God's people ought to regularly say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Is this what you want me to do? Am I in your will? Is this your will for my life? Am I doing what you want me to do? And if something comes along, you ought to consider. You ought to be willing. You ought to say, Lord, uh, is this what you want me to do? Is this where you want me to go? A, a missionary comes and says, hey, there's a need in this land for people to come and to be involved in the, getting the gospel to them. I believe God's people ought to say, Lord, do you want me to go? But I believe a lot of people, we don't do it. You know why? We're afraid you'll say yes. That's right. We're afraid God will say, yes, I do want you. So the way we get out of it, we never ask. David inquired of the Lord. He said, I want to do what you want me to do. Because of the concerns of his men, he questioned God again regarding this call. Now let me say something to you. I don't believe David sinned when he questioned the call of God. Don't believe he sinned. It wasn't a question in doubt. It wasn't a question seeking a way out of that call. It wasn't, Lord, I really don't want to go. Are you sure there's somebody else that could do this? That wasn't the question. It was, I want to make sure this is the right thing. I want to make sure this is the right thing. You know, the Bible says in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. All right, how many men did David have? Had 400. Now, I don't know that all 400 men came to David and said, wait a minute, what are you fixing to do? But these were men David trusted. They became his mighty men. Yes, sir. And those men he trusted, those men that might counsel him came and said, listen, are you sure what we're doing is the right thing? I don't believe there's anything wrong with double-checking just to make sure you're right in the will of God. 
I don't believe there's a problem with coming back and saying, Lord, I believe that's what you want me to do, but I want to be sure I'm doing the right thing. There's nothing wrong with questioning that call. Now, not a question is if, Lord, are you crazy? No, it's Lord, are you, this, this is what I, I think you want me to do. I want to be sure, though. Look, there's not a thing in the world wrong with being certain that we're in the will of God. And to question, to make sure. You may get involved in something and things go wrong sometimes at the very beginning. And you may want to stop and say, Lord, are you sure? You know, we tell you about last week in, in Belize and the great day they had and this morning the great day they had. But can I tell you something? If we were to track that thing back a few years ago, things weren't bustling like that. I'm sure there were some Sundays in there and there were some circumstances, there were some situations that came along that made Brother Whitaker say, Lord, are you sure this is where you want us to be? You see, I've heard of many missionaries working and working and working and they have their first service and they open the doors and they get ready and nobody's there except the missionary and his family. So what'd they do? Well, they had the service. They had the service. So it was discouraging? Probably. So did they question the call of God? Lord, are you sure? Probably. Is that okay? It's all right. And God reassured. God reassured David. David, he said to him, and now notice the difference in the answer in verse 2 and in verse 4. In verse 2, it's go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. In verse 4, he said, arise. Go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. You're going, you're doing what I want you to do, and I'm going to bless the effort, you're going to win. Now that's a good thing. He questioned it, but it did come out all right. All right. Now I want you to notice a few other things. Number one, number one, circumstances don't affect our duty. Circumstances don't affect our duty. David had a duty to the people of God, even though his circumstances were not ideal. But those circumstances don't affect our duty. I can't begin to tell you how many times when I've come and I've asked people, listen, you know, what about this? What's going on? Well, preacher, you don't understand. Let me explain. And they begin to roll out the circumstances why they can't serve God, why they can't do what God wants them to do. If you just understood the circumstances, you would understand why I can't do what God wants me to do. And I say this to you, your circumstances, my circumstances don't affect our duty. Amen. They don't affect our duty at all. Man, we, we get up some mornings. I remember days when I was a bus captain, and man, Sunday morning rolls around, and you hear this rumble. And it's not a diesel truck going by either. No, sir. It's thunder. And man, you open the door and it's raining. Yes, sir. And you think, okay, Lord, surely you don't want us to run the bus on a day like today. We're going to get wet. Amen. The circumstances are not conducive to doing this. And, and you, you get out there, those circumstances didn't affect. It was our duty as a bus captain to show up, take that bus, go out, go to those doors, knock on doors. Well, you get wet. You've been wet before, haven't you? Amen. Yeah, you know, most of us will probably survive getting wet a little bit. Amen. And uh, circumstances don't affect our duty whatsoever. We're to take care of our duty regardless of the circumstances. Amen. And it may be good, it may be bad. But you can't wait till the circumstances satisfy you to do what God wants you to do. You just need to go and do what God wants you to do. If the weather's bad, you serve Him. If the weather's good, you serve Him. You serve him. Um, almost every church in the United States had a down attendance last Sunday because of the circumstance that we moved our clock back an hour. Well, Bridger, I just couldn't get up. Not true. You just didn't get up. We just don't get up. It's not that we can't. We just don't. All right? Now, I'm not talking about people that are sick. I'm talking about just a few circumstances. Well, I got in bed late. Okay. 
Hey, we, we, we had folks here this morning, we had folks here this morning that, that, that worked all night last night. Amen. Amen. I, 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 I get so aggravated at kids in school Amen. that can't get to work on time. Well, I couldn't get out of bed. I'll never forget, we had one year, we had a, a, a senior in, in high school, and uh, she was there on time every day, and she threw a paper out every morning. So that means she got up about three o'clock every morning and drove and threw a paper out. She was on. She was at school on time. You know, I get so tired of the excuses God's people give for why they can't do what God wants them to do. Why? Well, the circumstances. Forget the circumstances. Is it your duty to do what God wants you to do or not? I can you just imagine? You know, here comes Revelation. And everybody else falls out of the bunk except one guy. And the drill sergeant comes in there and says, what are you doing? I couldn't sleep last night. Now those of you who have been in service know how that would have played out, right? It would not have been advantageous to that fellow who couldn't sleep last night. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work like that. But we think the circumstances, you, well, preacher, that's different. Tell me how it is. Is it more important for a soldier out here to be in doing his duty, or is it more important for a child of God who could be standing between life and death on somebody that's right. to do their duty? Forget circumstances. Circumstances don't affect our duty. Number two, convenience does not affect our duty. Convenience is not required. Convenience is just not required. Now, I'll tell you the truth of the matter is sometimes it's not convenient to serve God. It doesn't fit in, all right? It just doesn't fit in. I, I've had people call me, and I don't want you to feel sorry for me because I, I don't feel sorry for me. I, I knew what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. But I've had my phone ring 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Preacher, I need you to come to the hospital. I can. It's not convenient. Well, preacher, that's different. Wait a minute. Do you serve God or do you not serve God? Yes, sir. Amen. I just want to tell you something, all right? Convenience is not a necessity for us to do our duty. There's a lot of things that aren't convenient. They are not convenient, but it doesn't mean we are not to do our duty. Number three, I want you to see this. Quitting is never an option. Never an option. Never an option. So many of God's people are so quick yes, to think, well, things just didn't go out the way, and I, I think I'm just going to quit. Right. Amen. Wait a minute, did God call you or not? Come on. God called you or not. I've had people call me on the phone, folks serving God, and say, preacher, I'm, I'm thinking about leaving here. You know, I, this has happened and that's happened, and, and, and I'm thinking about leaving. And, and I, I've said to them, I said, wait a minute, I just want to ask you this. Did God call you to go there? Yep, God called you. Now, all right, next question. Did God tell you to leave? Well, no, God hadn't told me to leave. I said, well, wait until he tells you to leave. Right. Amen. Wait until he tells you to leave. And I've had that same person years later, uh, time, months or years later come and say, hey, thanks. That's what I needed. I needed somebody to tell me that. Look, quitting's not an option. Quitting is not an option. You can't just bail out. Yeah. You, you that have raised children, did you ever get to a point, maybe on an occasion, where you say, that's it, I've had it. <clears throat> get rid of them, all right? You know, you push me too far. But you don't have the option of quitting. You can't take the children and bundle their clothes up, put them on the front doorstep and say, maybe somebody will come by and pick you up. <laughs> it's not an option. Quitting is not an option. Wait a minute. Doing your duty as a child of God and serving the Lord, quitting is not an option. We, we, we don't come to a point where we say, I'm done. So what do you mean by doing your duty? Hey, things like, it's your duty to live the life of a Christian. It's your duty to live the life of a Christian, an example to everybody else. All right? The Apostle Paul said, man, you're our epistle known and written of me. said, you're it. People read you. Folks, I'm tell you, God, people around this world, they read your life too. They know you claim to be a child of God. Do you live like you are? You've got a duty to live like a Christian. That's right. You've got a duty to do that. You've got a duty. Hey, you say, well, that made me mad. I didn't mean you've got an excuse to 
cursed. Amen. You're a child of God. Amen. You're a child of God. We live in a day, man, where language boy is so fouled Amen. up. And there's so much cursing and everything. Amen. You've got a duty as a child of God that you do not have the right to take that tongue and just let it flow with whatever. When I've lost my temper, I don't care. That's why God puts your tongue behind uh, lips and teeth. You keep your lips together and your teeth together and whatever you, it's not coming out, all right? It's not coming out. You've got a duty to live like a Christian. You have a duty to do that. Hey, you've got a duty to show up. Does your Bible not say forsake not the assembling of yourselves together? That's what your Bible says. And it goes on to say, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Amen. Not less, but more. Say, hey, preacher, you're preaching to the Sunday night crowd. I know who I'm preaching to. Amen. But I want you to realize it is your duty to show up. Right. So I, I'm taking the week off. What well, gave you the right to do that? I gave you the right to do that. We, you know, somebody said, well, you just come back from a vacation in Belize. You should have been with us. You should have been with us. Should have been there. I, I want you to know, somebody said, well, you've been to Belize, you come back with a tan. Well, not really. We weren't out getting the tan, all right? Just whatever tan you can get, we was knocking on doors, we are trying to witness to people, handing out tracks. Did we look around? we do a little sightseeing? We did. But that wasn't the focus. The focus was to go there to pray and to witness Amen. and to preach. Amen. That was the important thing. That was the important thing. Hey, listen, uh, it's our duty to show up. Just show up. Just be there. Just be there. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the situation is, no matter how convenient it is, hey, it's our duty to speak up. To speak up. You ever think how many times you miss a chance maybe to witness to somebody? Just witness to somebody. Look, that's why I try to encourage you to carry a pocket full of tracks. It doesn't have to be stuff full, but you ought to have some with you. You ought to have some with you. I'm going to be honest with you. God provided me a track to give to a lady in Houston. Now, I had to go all the way to Belize to get the track. Amen. But on, and I think it was, uh, I think it was Thursday morning. We were getting ready to fly back. We were trying to tie up some loose ends there, and we were trying to print out a, a boarding pass, and we had problems. But while we were sitting there, Brother uh, Whitaker was sitting there at his desk, and he reached over in his desk, and he reached over in his desk, and he pulled out probably about four or five of our church tracks. And he had had them while he was here, and he had carried them to Belize with him. So he gave them to me, and I stuck them in my pocket. And then while we were in Houston, uh, between coming in and changing planes, had a little layover, and that time was extended. And that time was extended, and this lady came up, and she said, is anybody sitting in that chair? I said, well, my wife was, but she can sit in this one here. You go ahead and have a seat. Feel free. And she sat down, and I struck up a conversation with her. Now, I didn't reach in my bag. I had my Bible. I didn't reach in my bag and said, let me preach to you for a little bit. Amen. I didn't do that. But we just struck up a conversation. Now, I don't know what you talk about. And I can't hardly ever think, talk to anybody about anything without finally getting around to where you go to church. And honestly, I don't remember how I got around to that question. But somewhere in the course of it, I, I told her, I said, well, I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church, Halton City. This church right here, and I handed her a track. And, uh, and, and we were talking, and I found out, all right? She's the lady I mentioned to you. She got saved in South, uh, Southside Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas, um, 20 plus years ago, probably. Um, Brother Marvin Weedle was the pastor, and she told about the experience and how she got saved and said, He married myself and my husband. They've been in uh, Seattle, Washington for like 22 years. They've just moved back. Guess where they live? They live in Hearst. Now, I'm coming back from Belize. I'm in the Houston airport meeting a woman there in, that, that lives in Hearst. Amen. Now, that wouldn't have happened if I'd have just... Yeah. Here, go ahead and sit down. 
Now, I could have dozed off. I'm good at dozing off. I mean, I can sit down. I can get comfortable pretty much anywhere. Now, all I did is struck up a conversation with her. And she told me she was on the flight back with us, and uh, I saw her after we got landed here over in DFW. And I said, listen, I, I sure do hope you'll come visit. She said, we will. We'll come visit. We'll come visit. All you have to do is talk to people. Speak up. It's our duty to speak up. It's our duty. Now, carry tracks with you. Hand them out. Put them in somebody's hand. Hey, it's our duty to be faithful. It's our duty to sacrifice. That's our duty to do those things. Man, I, I couldn't begin to tell you the books that I've read about soldiers uh, during World War II and the sacrifices they went through and the things they endured to get the job done they were uh, trying to do as a soldier. And you and I have got every advantage in the world. Hey, we no longer go to a church building where it's not air conditioned. We, go, we sit in a church building, it's air conditioned. Now, it doesn't matter if it's heated or air conditioned. There's always somebody too cold and always somebody too hot. There's always somebody not satisfied completely, all right? But, hey, you sit on a padded pew. First pews I remember were made out of one by four slats. The, the last word that comes to mind about those pews is comfort. But, man, I was a little kid. I was able to sleep on those pews. I could sleep on that pew. I never complained about it either. You know? But here we've got padded pews. We've got carpet on the floor. We've got air conditioning. We've got every convenience in the world that's easy. Look, we can hop in a vehicle that's heated and air conditioned. We can zip across town to where we want to be. It is not a hard thing for us to do. It is an easy thing. We are blessed with tracks that you can carry in your pocket, easy to pull out and put in somebody's hand. It's an easy thing. Right. Listen, what do we need to do? We need to sacrifice our own, you know, uh, ego right. and just show up and do the duty that God demands of us. Right. Hey, there are some demands of duty on us. There's a call of God. And, and we're to answer that call. We have a duty. We have a duty to our God. We have a duty to the people of God. And I got news for you. We got a duty to this old wicked, sinful world. We're the ones that have the truth. Amen. We're the ones that have the truth of the Word of God. Nobody else does. Hey, look, the Hindus, they don't have the truth. They don't have the truth. We've got the truth that's right here in the Word of God. We've got the, man, we've got a responsibility. We've got a duty to get that truth to them. Just carry the gospel. So I'm very shy. We'll do it very shy. Very shy. Well, you know, I, I'm pretty brash. We'll do it brashly then. I'm just telling you, I don't care what it is. You've got a duty. And that duty demands that we act upon. Are you doing your duty tonight? Are you doing your duty? Do you ever stop to ask the Lord, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Should I do this? Do you do that? Now, some of them said, well, I did, and he never answered in an audible voice. And he's not going to. But if you'd come to him, you'd know what his will is. What about your duty to your God? Are you doing it? Heavenly Father, I pray that you to speak to our hearts. Help us to see the importance of our duty and us doing what we're supposed to do for you. Lord David stepped up in a very inconvenient time, in, in very difficult circumstances. Lord, everything might have said don't, but he inquired of you and you told him, this is what I want you to do. And he did it and you blessed. Lord, we don't face anything today like what David faced, but we do have a duty that we're to do. We do have that which we're to carry out those demands that duty as a Christian makes upon us. Lord, help us just do our duty. Help us to do that. Speak to hearts tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand tonight? We want to sing page 17.